Good morning, Hemsha Chaim Beis, Volume Three. We are on page thirteen forty-seven, and as uh, we've been learning, the Rebbe Rashab is now tying together and concluding a big section of Ayin Beis. I would say almost five, over five hundred pages, addressing the issue of how in a post symptom existence and consciousness, we can experience a pre symptom reality or pre symptom consciousness. And that is briefly, as we, the way to do that is not by bypassing the symptom, which is necessary, and all of existence is predicated on that. It's not overriding it or bypassing it or, or succumbing and surrendering to it, but rather by transforming it. It's a transformation of this symptom, which means entering the dark world of existence where the divine is concealed, which the Rebbe Rashab, in a very succinct and powerful way, summed that up. I'll just give you the pages because it's a very fundamental section. And that is, give you the actual page for that. Um, how come I don't find it now? Oh, it's earlier. That's fine. Um, on page 1307, he explained the entering into the dark world. And our job through Aveda, through our work, is to reverse the process and transform the darkness into light. But there are three steps and three levels of how that transformation takes place. The first is what we call the first level of the sweetening of the bitter waters of gvura, of severities, of tzimtzum, of darkness. And that is by bringing enough holiness into it or enough sweet water that it overrides the darkness. But that's not a transformation. The second step is transforming it with even more powerful energy, essentially what Sadiqim do, where the ayin, eliki, the divine transcendence, and the experience of shema transforms sheimban, the animal, the darkness. So this is already a transformation. It's not just neutralizing it or nullifying it in the presence of so much more light. The darkness is transformed, but it's not transformed from within. It's transformed from without. Mamailalamat, from the top down. Or yashar. And then comes the third which is the full and complete, the true yichud, that he calls, where you're transforming it from within. The darkness itself becomes the catalyst that ultimately reveals its root in the Helama Atzmi, in where the first root of where darkness originated from in the first place, which is the concealment, God's power to conceal. And that's the true Baal Tshuva. And that's the, the, that's the yichud that he calls the higher level of yichud. He'll use the words that he used there. Amiti sin yichud that time itself becomes beyond time. Space itself becomes beyond space. Or in the words of the Posik, Ein Oid. So Havaya Elikim is Havaya is, is infusing Elikim, the concealment, with a level of revelation. And Elikim gets transformed as a result. But that's Havaya Elikim. That's like the Oiris in the Kalim, like he put it on the bottom of page 1346, which we learned yesterday. He says, that and it transforms the Shem Elikim in a real way, but it's all in Eris Vigiluyim. It's Eris and Kalim. So the Kalim have become now infused with and transformed by the Eris. But the Kali itself, the next level is Einoid, the end of the verse. Which means even in the space of the world, the Rishimu itself reveals the divine and the root, the helama atzmi itself becomes gilu. So now it's not the ayin is going into the yesh, the yesh is being transformed into an ayin. We're transforming the very substance of existence, shame ban. And that's the third level of sweetening. Not from shema, but from within the very existence of this, of the darkness itself.
And that's the last line we learn. Now, he's going to go back, as I said, tying it all together. Remember, there was the, the verse that we say that's connected within the Haftarah, the end of the Haftarah of Rosh Hashanah, Havai Yechat Merivov, that the enemies of God are shattered. And he explained earlier that that is only shattering and the goal is ultimately to transform. So those are the next two sections of the verse. What does it say after Havai Yechat Merivov? It says, Ve'yitain Eiz Lamalke. He gives strength to the Malke, to his king. And the Yodam Keren Meshichai, and he exalts or elevates Rodam Keren, the crown or the Keren, the corner of Mashiach. So now he's going to explain that these three, Avaya Chatam Riva, the Yitan Eiz Lamalke, the Yodam Keren Meshichai, even though I don't know if he says it explicitly, but it's clearly three levels in the transformation of the darkness. One is shattering it, one is, second is transforming, but not from within, and the third is transforming from within. From the Etzem. So this is taking us back now to pages 1299. Go back to 12, Aleph Reh Sadiq Tess, where he discussed this. So let's see here. Well, actually, 12, uh, what did I say? 1298 and then 1299. So in 1298, if you go back, you'll see he's now going to take those ideas which really go back to the beginning of volume three as well and tie it into what we've been discussing here. So let's learn this inside. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll draw from those pages just as much as we need for clarity purposes. Just one second. So here's how it goes. I'm reading now from the, it's around the 10, 12 lines from the top of the page, 1347. You can follow along at com. So the line begins, Mishema. So Shemban will be in the future higher than Shema because there's the elevation from within and from below. That re reaches my Asma saying so. Vizel Vayitan Malke. And this is Vayitan Ezla Malke. One, guys, one second, please. One second. Okay, sorry about that. So if you go back to page, what I said, 1299. Um, let me go back, 1299. Aleph Reh Sadiq So you'll see that he said, V'yotun Viyotun Malke, is the Amshacha from Z into Zah into Malchus. And the Yorim Kerem Meshichi is Malchus elevated to Hela Ma'atzmi. So he's now going to tie that together here. So he says, V'zehu v'yitin ez l'malke, dokud shibrichu. That's the Zayar v'yikra that he cited on page 1299. And V'yorim Kerem Meshichi, dok Yisrael. And the second statement, the second phrase, is dok Yisrael. So Lamalke is referring to Kutchabrichu, which is Za, and Keryorim Keryorim Shiche is referring to Knesset Za, which is Malchus. The Inyan Vayitane is Lamalke, that he gives strength to his Melech, who Gamkim Abkhinis Takbeda Se'er, which means strength. Oiz means giving strength, so it's coming from a Gvura, but 
as we learned earlier, the gvura here is the intensity of gvura, not the tzimtzum, not the concealment of gvura, but it's tagbeda sa'ir, the intensity of the light. Shazayin agvura sheibchinus tagbedas. So he's giving gvura to his melech, meaning that he is infusing it with a very powerful air that has the power to transform. That shema, like we learned earlier, shouldn't just be passing through like, like the glow on the face, which we said is coming from shema within the mind. However, the forehead and the face is like a uh, partition. So it's only passing through. You don't have the shema be'etzem. It's only piercing, it's like just a drop that's piercing through. But rather, so that's how it would be shema on its own. But here, Vayitan Oiz is that he's transforming, is giving it more power. Raki is gala shema mamish. That shema mamish literally will be revealed, like he spoke at the bottom of page 1343, that Mashiach is going to, is going to come with that revelation. And that revelation is already a higher power that has the power to transform Shema, transforming Shemban. Like we said, Sadiq, Sadiqim will arrive at a level of Tshuva, but it's due to the intensity, due to their closeness to the divine. So that's the first half. And that light will be so intense, so it will also radiate in the place of darkness. That the darkness should be transformed to air, but it's coming from a force outside of it. And this is higher than the first part of the verse. Remember we said, that the enemies of God will be shattered. So he says, There, you're dispelling the darkness. Like the first level. Meriv of Yechatu means shattering, breaking. You're destroying that. You're annihilating the enemy. Here we're talking about transforming the enemy. So even though it's the second level of sweetening, and it's not the highest level, but it's higher than Havsham Yechatu Meriv of, which is like the first level. So the first level is pushing it aside. The second level is transforming it with a higher power. That's Oiz Lemalka, Vayit and Oiz Lemalka. And the parentheses that Rebbe Rashab continues, the Eilnes border, and earlier was explained, This second level, of, of, uh, we learned earlier, is that in the higher level of Avaya radiates an air that's higher than Avaya, because Avaya is still within the structure of Yud Kevavke. So Shema Vaya is the first level because there, there is an enemy, but you're overpowering the enemy. Like we learned over there in the beginning, Havaya Yechata Merivav, he asked the question, Havaya Yechata Merivav, he's shattering the enemy, but we know that Ibishta is higher than the enemy. So it's all different levels of Havaya. We actually have three levels of Havaya, to be honest. The first is Havaya Yechata Merivav, shattering the enemy. The second is Havaya that's that's that that's even higher than that. That's higher from Shema Vaya. And that transforms. And then the third, remember, we said was Shema Atzmi, Helema Atzmi, that's beyond it all. So he says, okay, so now we're talking about Lamail Meshema Vaya of Rakshazel Kumashemir Bishema Vaya. But it's a higher level that's radiating within a vaya. Whereas the first level, pushing aside the enemy, which is shattering it, not transforming it, that is from Shema Vayet. And what it says, it gives strength to the Malach. I may have read it wrong. I want to read it again. I may have interpreted it wrong. Let me look again. I have to go back to see how it was explained earlier, to be honest. 
When I'm reading it now, I think I read it incorrectly. I think the first level he explained earlier is coming from Havaya. That's that the Havaya that's the uh, earth that's higher than Avaya is radiating Avaya, and that pushes aside the enemy. But it's happening within Avaya because that's where the enemy is Tefus Malkim, has value. The Yitanez Lamalke is Am Etzama Er Kamashahu, even higher than that. I need to get back to you about this because I have to look it up and see how he explained it earlier. There was a whole discussion about this. Um, Okay, I'll look it up later. And finally, the last section, what about the third part? So it says, Ach v'yorim kerem m'shichei. Now the third, the final phrase is that he exalts the keren, the crown, or the keren. We learned keren has several, several meanings in it. The etzim of Mashiach, hu b'chines ha-malchus be'etzim. That's malchus already in its etzim. Behind the keren m'shichei, b'chines ha-atzimus the malchus. The core of malchus, ye b'chines remus the 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 Kermit Shirin Musa Atmos the Malchus Yeh Bchinis Rei Musa Atmos the Ein Sof will be the Rei Musa Atmos the exaltedness the 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 what's the word I want to use uh, not just exaltedness the grandeur of Atmos Ein Sof which what he called earlier was Hela Ma Atmi higher than all levels of Ur altogether so there you have the three levels Havaya Chata Meriva which as I said I think is now Havaya, the level of Ur higher than Havaya, rating it in Havaya, and therefore that pushes aside the enemy. And Helama Atzmi, Remus Atzmus is Vayyarim Kerem I believe that's the way to read it. That's the way to understand it. Okay. Any questions? Let's get to any questions. It's all clear? Nobody has questions? Okay. Let me quickly look at what he said before. See if I could quickly uh, sum it up here. Okay, I think I'm going to need more uh, delving into here. Okay. If everything is clear, then I'm going to just sum up what we learned now. Because the next section is going to take us back all the way back to volume two. He's going to go back to the title of the Magid, back on page nine, um, 896. So we're literally talking about <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of pages back. 
So the truth is, I would have loved to end the class right here and begin this in a new class, but since we have plenty of time, I'm gonna I'm, we'll start the new paragraph. But let me just the end, um, the end of the parentheses that 500 uh, page parentheses next page. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. A parentheses that began, as I said, in page 896. We're now page 1347. So you add that up, right? Um, the truth is the parentheses began a lot earlier. But we're talking about the last parentheses was on 896. So 896 is what? Uh, four pages makes it 900. 450. How much? 450? Yeah. yeah. But the Magid, as I said, the terror of the Magid actually begins 100 pages before that. So it's more like 520 pages, I think, is the total, the, the, the entire thing. But just one more, one, one, give me one more moment, one second. Okay. So let me just elaborate a bit more about what we just learned. Um, remember, just keep in mind the central theme of Ayan Bayes, and that is the interface. The interface, creating an interface between existence and the divine, or the divine and existence. That's the central theme. To do so requires plenty of work because you're dealing with two antithetical entities, something completely two ends of the spectrum, not even the same spectrum. Everything is everything about them is antithetical. And yet God created existence and gave us the power to transform it. So in the language of Chassidus, we talk about Mamala Kalam and Seva Kalam and then Atmos. We talk about the divine as it relates to existence. Think of the artist as he invests himself and gets involved in the details of what the art he's creating, that's like the godliness of mamalakalamin. Mamalakalamin, literally, it fills, it permeates existence. Let there be light. In day two, let there be a firmament. firmament. The earth shall produce vegetation. These are specific details, and God is applying himself. He doesn't just say, poof, let there be a world. He's applying it. my modus, which originate from the 10 spheres. Each sphere has its personality, and that personality is a divine person, a divine as a manifest in personality, which in turn shapes and divines the personality of existence, or we'll call it the art or the music of existence, the poetry, divine poetry. But of course, this comes with a concealment, because if this divine is not concealed, you won't have a world that has an independent consciousness. So you have a combination of two things. You have a world created by this artist, but he concealed his presence. And it's our work is to reveal it within the art. Then comes level two, which is Seva of Kalam. This is really the divine that looks more at the world from the outside, so to speak, like a bird's eye view. The artist envisioning the whole picture, but not particularly involved in the details. It's like seeing the whole picture of Seva of Kalam. It transcends. But that still relates to existence. However, it relates to it more from like a bird's eye view, from, a, from the bigger picture. And then there's Etzem, which is beyond both of them, that has the power to join and combine both. Now, why do we need all three? Because as we explained in a good interface, you need to have something that relates to you. You need something that relates to the other, and you need something that joins them together. If you have a good translator, the translator between, let's say, Hebrew and English, he needs, he, he needs to know English to be able to communicate. He needs to be able to know Hebrew to be able to take what the teacher is saying in Hebrew and translate it to the other in English. He needs both well, and then he needs something that knows how to join the two. They don't remain two different worlds. So essentially, Mamala Kalaman is the divine that relates to us. So when we say and we contemplate, instead of having a focus of life being self-interest, you say, one second, God created me. And then we say the blessings. Thank you for Pukeya Chivrim, Malbisharumim. 
Zekev Kfufim. Thank you for building me, giving me intelligence, giving me strength, everything that, thank you God for the, all the different nourishment and sustenance you provide. Hazana Sarkoil. So there you're acknowledging and you're connecting with the divine as it relates to you. As we learn, mutfa, it relates to you. You understand and you can relate to it, which is obviously progress because it's better than just focusing that I'm a self-made person and I don't need to acknowledge anything. At least here, you're bringing godliness into your life, but it's on your terms. Then comes the next level where you realize God is beyond you. He's not just here to sustain you. And he's not just, and he has much more to him. So you begin to have, want to have a relationship with what he is outside of you or beyond you. That's called transcendence. That's like Er Habligvul, not the Er Habligvul, but the Er Habligvul. However, the Er Habligvul, on one hand, it creates more bittle because it lift, lifts you up beyond yourself into something greater than yourself. On the other hand, is it permeating within you? We want the joining of Sevav Kalam and Amal Kalam, that the divine that's beyond existence should be within existence. So we have the third level that's beyond both of them and able to join the two. This is a common theme in Chassidus in general, but in Ayin Bays, you see these three constantly cropping up here and there all the time. It keeps coming back. When he talked about the three interpretations in Keser in volume one, the three meanings in spheres, it, 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 Keser, the level of Keser that relates to existence, the level of Keser that's beyond, and the level that's completely beyond. When we talk about Helen, a Helen that we, there's Gilui, revelation, then there's a concealment, but it's a concealment that could be revealed. And then there's Helen Asmi, fundamentally concealed. So you constantly have these three levels coming up throughout Ayin Beis. So in many ways, what we've been learning about the three levels of sweetening. And like I just said, three levels is referring to that. Because in level number one, though it relates to us, because it, the godliness relates to existence, so there you could have a managid. Remember the early question that he asked is, how could there be a managid? How could something oppose God? God's the creator. But the answer is because we're talking about Havaya as he relates to existence and allows there to be an enemy. Obviously, God is beyond anything. But the godliness that manifests in existence, Kavyochel, so to speak, like we spoke before about Golas, God is affected, so to speak, Kavyochel by Golas. So he's affected by a Menagid. However, Havaya Ishmael Chama, he has the power to overcome the Menagid. In other words, the battle is fought like we find in Chumash. The battle in this week's parasha with Midian, the battle with Amalek. So there is a battle. The battle is won by the people of God, but there's a battle. That means you're engaging with existence. So you can't call it transforming the enemy. You call it contending with the enemy and, win, and winning, like the, bit, like the sweet waters that overpower the bitter waters. But there, but there was a battle. Then comes a level from Avaya, from Seva of Kalam, and that's now. Now, no, it's, it's not, let me add something. And in order to win the battle, you need Hamshacha from a higher place to give you the strength to do so. Then comes level two, where here you're above the enemy. But to say that there's no darkness, there is darkness. The, but the, being above gives you the power to zap it, like we said, to transform it, not just to push it aside, not just to vanquish it, but to transform it. But you're transforming it with Shema. With the gili er, or the gili er of Sev of Kalam, what he calls here etzema er, it's still er. It's like the avoid of sadikim. The first avoid is a battle. Think of the bainani. The bainani has a battle. However, like he says in Tanya, that the two against one, beginning of Perek Yud Gimel, he says zev zeh sheftan, that the the divine soul says its opinion, like a judge. The animal soul says its opinion. Vashem. Amen. The Amine, God sides with the divine soul, and the Bainani wins the battle, but he's always fighting. It's in his garments that thought, speech, and action are not controlled by the animal soul, but within there's a battle. That means he's engaging with it. So he has the power of godliness to help him, but he's within the battle. The Tzaddik, on the other hand, has won the battle. Not only won the battle, like he says in chapter 9 in Tanya, he's transformed as the animal soul. 
with the sheer power of Ma. And especially Lhasa Lavi, when it'll be the Gili of Shei Ma Be'etzem, not just Bedet al like he says, that it pierces or passes through, then it will be complete transformation and will also have the quality of tshuva. Like we said, the tshuva relative to the tzaddik, he feels his inadequacy because he's gotten so powerfully close to the divine. But it's still coming from ma, from oir. Etzema oir. Like he says here. And then comes v'yarim kerem mishiche. This you're now dealing with malchus as it is in the darkness, that the darkness itself is rooted in the etzem that's higher than seva v'amamala. It's higher than keli. That's where the, that's mamal climbing where the eris and the kelim come together level one. It's higher than the oir, the etzem oir even, which is still an element of gilui, like the tzaddikim. This is a level of hela ma'atzmi, what he calls remus atzmus, a level that's completely beyond. Like remember we said about the king, there's the king, even though he's exalted and higher than the nation, completely higher than them, and he's an equalizer, but he still relates to them. He has compassion on them because it's his nation, it's his empire, it's his people, it's his subjects. Then there's a level of a king, like he said, when we said, going back to page um, uh, page 1341, he said, that's coming from a level that's even higher than Gilil Atzme. There's no revelation altogether. He's completely beyond everything. Remus Atzmus, Thelema Atzmi. And that's what we reach when we transform the darkness from within the darkness. Gvurus Nim Tokim Bisharshan, they're sweetened from their root, not from light, not from a battle within, but from a force that they themselves have something that is rooted in the deepest levels. So you have here the three stages in the battle. One is you fight the battle, you engage with it, and you win. You're out, you're, you're, you're out, you, you vanquish the enemy, but you have not transformed the enemy. You've engaged with it and you're on its level, but you brought in a power that is able to subdue the enemy. Like the first level of sweetening the bitter waters. You haven't changed the bitterness. You just brought enough sweetness. So you want but the bitterness will always remain as long as you're on that level. It just has been, right now, it tastes sweet. It's like winning a battle and you, and you win a city, but in the city there's plenty of enemies that are just quiet because you subdued them, you intimidated them. You control them. Level two is you transform them, but you transform not from within, from a force outside of them. So they've been transformed, but they've not really fully been. That's why they. That's why when you leave, they may come back and arise, rise. But regardless, it is a transformation, but it's coming from the power of light, divine light. And the third is that in the enemy itself lies a divine root, the root of the Hela Ma'atzmi, the Remus Ma'atzmi. And when you can trigger that, because when the enemy himself says, you know what? Like we said, hitting rock bottom, the darkness itself validates and more than validates it becomes the catalyst for uh, for the divine a true tshuva from the darkness that's total transformation because then there's really no room anymore for any enemy in the first level there's room for an enemy and not only that the enemy is there you just you just neutralize it at least temporarily second level you transformed it but you're not transformed it it doesn't not from within but from without you were able to persuade it you're able to overpower it to the point that you not just neutralize, but transform. And the third is that the enemy itself reveals its source. How is it possible there should have been a Helen in the first place? Because it comes from the Helen Ma'atzmi. And that ties together with these three levels, as well as everything we've been learning till now. And I'll add one more thing, the Mimer of the Amitla Rebbe that I referred to, where on La Sovet Sadiqai B'ti Yufta, a long Mimer, so he actually, these three points, Havai Yechate Meriva, Gan Eden, and Elam Haba that we learned about earlier, what Aveda does beyond Gan Eden, and finally the concept of Tzadikim doing Tshuva that we learned about Yesh and Ayin and Ayin Yesh is all based on that Maim and the Mitla Rebbe. So he brings Havai Yechate Meriva and these two things, Yitin Eiz Lamalkei and Mayorim Kerem Meshichei, Gan Eden and Elam Haba, which we didn't address here, but was addressed earlier, and finally, this concept of tzaddikim and tshuva joining together 
that will also love in the future will have ma'ban both above and below, and ultimately in a form of ein oid, which is really the Rebbe Rashab's edition, ein oid, like he said, not just havayu alakim, but ein oid. So you have all levels. You could even say in the Pasuk of Eschanon, havayu alakim b'shamayim mimal, while the oris mitachas, there you have two levels, how havayu alakim come together below and above, and then ein oid, that the darkness of alakim itself Reveals its root in the in the in the helama atzmi. So you have all levels here: alakim, havaya, and enoid. And they all are the three stages of transformation that we've been talking about. Okay. So that sums up what we learned. As I said, I will just begin the next few lines. On the but let me stop if anybody wants to ask anything. That's a wonderful summation. It's a wonderful summation. But we didn't. One thing you didn't mention is uh, that sometimes the, uh, the the tzaddikim also do the the third level when there's something just not quite there. The tzaddikim never reached the level. Even they're the a little for something the less good than us, something they, they transform. We talked about they that. They have there. a mile of tshuva. But it's not for the darkness, it's because of the light. So the Sadiqim do not have the third level on their own. Uh, they transform the darkness. What's their darkness? The darkness relative to them. Okay, so you, you, you changed it a little from what we were talking about today. No, I don't think so, but uh, because I, I am very, I, you know, this is pretty clear. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, so now let me give a little introduction that now brings us back. So if you go back to volume two in Ayin Bays, you'll see this whole subject matter began back on page 896. So in 896, I'm opening it up actually. Let's look inside. So there he spoke about, he said, it's one thing to say that you can reveal the divine in Atsilus. So even though Atsilus is a structured world with 10 spheres, nevertheless, I just want to get the exact words. Yeah. And then he says, however, the next step is how do you reveal the divine after under below Atsilas? Once there's a parsa, a partition that conceals, like he says, now with Musa when you say the, the, the supernal man, Adam Elian that sits on the kise. Kise is a throne, but Kise also has the word Kese. It conceals. So since it conceals, so the question is, how do you bring the vine into a world of concealment? And that begins a long discussion of the transformation of the Tzimtzum. So you see, everything we learned here is all about explaining how to bring the divine in a world of darkness. Generally speaking, after the passage between Atsilas and Bia, and obviously the deeper darkness in this world.
So, um, just one second here. So I'm going to go back and read. We're going to read the, the, word, the words of the Magid so we understand the context of all of this. I just want to see the earlier parentheses. One second, please. I saw this, yeah. to find ah I just want to see the first parentheses of the Rebbe, of the the Magi to understand the flow here Here we are. Yeah, the Musa Kishi is Borak Mokhusas Sham. I'm looking at the end of bottom of page 842. So we're talking now after the concealment. So the Rebbe, the Magid says then, Al Derech Vonon Veesh Mislakachas. That this concealment is like the cloud and the fire, the, the, the flaming fire. So that's an expression from the book of Yecheskel. And he explains, the Magid explains that that level, that Va'onon, what does the cloud refer to? Then the beginning, there's a dark state where a person is not inspired to daven with a passion. So the fire is of yeah. and then following that onon, onon is like a cloud that covers up, and then comes a fiery passion of his davening, that the nisham is get inspired to daven. So he explains that these are referring to the nishamas of biyah. In Atsilus, they don't have that concealment. They don't have that initial darkness. But by the Shama Sabiyah, they do. So you see a state of darkness that followed then by an inspiration. And that's where the long parenthesis begins that we're now concluding shortly. He hasn't concluded yet, but so he says, I'm just going to read one line just for the flow, and then tomorrow and on Sunday we'll continue. It says, with all that we discussed, We'll understand Yuvan Imre Kedesh Hamagid Nishmasayin. We'll understand the holy words of the Magid, going back to page eight ninety six. The Inyan Onon Veish Mislakachas. That first the darkness and then the fiery flame. The Mekedem Hachashchus Sheder Ba'Adam. From the beginning, there's a darkness that resides within the human being, a concealment. Sheeni Yachal Ispal Bislavus. He's unable to daven with a passion. And then afterwards, there comes an inspiration that ignites the flaming fire that he can daven with the Islavos. What this, what he's explaining the Rebbe Rashab is means that the way air comes, how do you get a fire coming? It first comes through a tzimtzum. Where the light was removed or concealed, and the light was diminished. That it comes and manifests in the beginning of its transmission in a state of darkness. And what that darkness, remember, we learned, the Tzimtzum conceals, and the Nekudas Arashima conceals the air within it. And it continues to descend level by level, through a number of concealments and a number of partitions, became to the point that it manifests in the containers of Atsilis. 
Vikalim that silas tafsimasair, like my shoe And the containers of Atsilis, they grasp and they contain the light, but not the way it's Ba'etzim, and now it's gone through all these concealments. Gamla Akhare Slapshis. In addition to, in other words, also after the manifestation went through a bunch of concealments. Umisalam Bahem. And the earth was, was concealed within these containers, concealed with, with these containers. And then when it goes even further, it becomes even more diminished. As that energy, divine energy, comes into the worlds of Bri, Yitzir, Asiya, it's now in a state of a multitude of containers. So this divine energy continues to conceal, it continues to be diminished. And he continues on. I'm just thinking where, how far I should go here. But bottom line is going to say it continues to be diminished until there comes the point where Arav Veda from the bottom up begins to transfer, to begins to refine and reveal more light, ultimately to the highest level of transformation that you transform the Kali itself to the Rishimu itself to the Helama Atzmi. That's what he's going to continue saying. But I see. It's not a few lines. It's a lot more than a few lines. So I just wanted to create the, the segue and the flow from what we've learned to what we're going to learn. I'm going to go over this again Sunday more in detail. But since we had time, I decided, you know, well, let me create the, the flow, the, the, the continuation here. So all that we understood, explained is going to make, help us understand the Magid's Teda that is very brief, the Magid's Teda, but nevertheless but is the foundation of all these pages of hundreds and hundreds of pages of the Rebbe Rashab's Ayin Beis here. Yeah. And then the parenthesis is going to come to an end on page 1348. Then he's going to continue with the language of the Magid for another two pages. And as I said, we're coming now to the end of this long, big section, all about the transformation that happens after the Tzimtzum and after the Parsa. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I'm going to go over it again. So be patient. But if anybody wants to ask anything now, please, by all means. Okay, so we're stopping. As I said, I'm going to go over this paragraph. But we began the middle paragraph on page 1347. Went uh, on 10 lines into it. So we're middle of 1347.